Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Donna Martinez. Welcome once again to Shaftesbury Society, coming to you live from the John Locke Foundation here in Midtown Raleigh. So glad you are along with us for another edition. What do I say every week? It's true every week. We've got another great conversation lined up for you. North Carolina's Constitution contains a unique collection of clauses that are intended to protect economic liberty. Now, the framers apparently added them at various points in our history in order to prevent what we call corporate cronyism and to protect free enterprise. But as one of our guests today is going to explain to us, North Carolina Court of Appeals Judge Richard Dietz. He argues in an upcoming academic paper. Also, he argues this in today's piece at carolinajournal.com right here, which Brene, my colleague, is going to uh, post the link to this piece so you can read it in the comments section of our Facebook page. He argues that these Protections have unfortunately been weakened, and he's going to be telling us all about that here this hour. Also joining me to talk about this, two of our good friends here at the John Locke Foundation. First, Jeanette Doran, who is president and general counsel of the North Carolina Institute for Constitutional Law. Jeanette, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Also joining us, John Guzay, my colleague here at the John Locke Foundation. John is the senior fellow in legal studies. He's an attorney himself, and uh, he analyzes legal issues here for the Locke Foundation. John, glad to have you along as well. Thank now, you, Doug. Now, Jeanette and John are going to hang tight for just a couple minutes here. They're going to be coming back into the conversation shortly. But first, we do want to hear from Judge Richard Dietz. Uh, Judge Dietz is with the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Judge, thank you so much for joining us here. Appreciate it. We're honored to have you with us. Judge, welcome. Uh, thank you, Donna. Uh, it's a privilege to be here and a privilege to, uh, as you said, uh, give this presentation today, which is based on an academic paper I wrote. But So let me start by saying uh, I'm a Court of Appeals judge, which means that I'm a lawyer and I'm about to give a legal talk that's based on an academic paper. So you might be getting worried at this point that <laughs> you're going to hear a bunch of you know, legally sort of lawyerly gobbledygook that uh, no one really understands. And to be fair, lawyers often take even the simplest things and make them so complicated that only other lawyers can understand them. But I want you to know that that's not what uh, this presentation is about. This is for everybody uh, because this is about constitutional rights and everyone needs to understand uh, the constitution. And so to hit this home, it reminded me of a joke that a friend sent me one time, which I'm gonna share with you. So this was back during uh, the early days of the Obama administration, uh, during the constitutional challenge, the first big lawsuit over the Affordable Care Act, over Obamacare. And everyone that cared even a little bit about politics at the time was closely watching what is the Supreme Court going to say about the constitutionality of Obamacare. And when the uh, Supreme Court finally handed down the decision and it immediately started spreading in the press and over social media, the decisions come out. And this was a big decision. This was, I think, including all the different opinions, more than 100 pages. Um, but I was practicing constitutional law as a, as a private lawyer at the time. And a friend of mine that also did constitutional work uh, sent me this internet meme, which I'll share with you right now. Brace yourselves. Everyone on Facebook is about to become a constitutional scholar. <laughs> and uh, so you can uh, understand this, right? It's, it was certainly true that uh, as soon as the decision came down, although there was not enough time for people to read and digest this complicated opinion from the Supreme Court, everybody had an opinion um, about the result. So here's the thing. If you're to tell me that everyone on the internet uh, thinks of themselves as a constitutional expert. My response to that is, that's great. That is wonderful. That is how it should be. I mean, if there's one area of the law where we should all be experts, it's the, our constitution and our constitutional rights. And I think it is true that the public generally has a pretty good understanding about some constitutional rights, in particular, what's in the Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution. But when we're talking about constitutional law, we're not just talking about one document. It's not just the US Constitution. There are actually 51 documents, 51 constitutions, because every state has its own constitution and they're all unique. Uh, they're all different. And what I find remarkable is that oftentimes if there is something that's unique about a constitution, so say for example, there's a provision in the Montana Constitution, you won't find anything like it in the New Jersey Constitution or the Florida Constitution or anywhere else. It's usually a reflection of 
what you can think of as the culture or the ethos of the people of that state. So it says something about the identity and what the people, how they identify themselves as citizens of that state. So these are very important provisions. So today I'm going to talk to you about some of these unique provisions that are in the North Carolina Constitution. And I'm going to start in 1868 to tell this story. Now, uh, this is North Carolina's second constitution. Remember, the North Carolina's original constitution is from 1776. It's earlier even than the U.S. Constitution. But in 1868, after the Civil War, during this time that we call Reconstruction, North Carolina had a new constitution, the second constitution. And what the framers did, the, fr the word framers means these are the people drafting the document, creating the constitution. The framers went back to the original constitution and they took what's called the Declaration of Rights. So think of it as the Bill of Rights in the North Carolina Constitution. And they copied it over. They pretty much took it all and just cut and pasted it right over and stuck it in the new constitution. But then they did something else. They added this new language at the beginning. And they said that in North Carolina, the people will have the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if you're hearing this, you might say, wait a minute, buddy, you just told me that we were going to hear uh, about some unique language. And by the 1860s, there's nothing unique about this language, right? You've heard it before. It's, uh, it was taken directly from Thomas Jefferson's words in the Declaration of Independence. But here's what's interesting. The framers added a fourth inalienable right. So in the 1868 Constitution, and this language is still in our modern North Carolina Constitution today, there's also the inalienable right, the people have the inalienable right to the enjoyment of the fruits of their own labor. Those were the words that the framers used. So a few years ago, I was looking at that and I said, you know, what? why did they pick this language? When the framers uh, added this provision, you know, wh where did the language come from? So I was looking at the convention materials because of course there was a constitutional convention to draft this new constitution. I was reading the works of the framers. So these were very brilliant people who had written books and other things. And so you can see what were they thinking about. And I realized that uh, there is an explanation for why they chose those words. And I'm going to share it with you right now. So I think it's very fitting at a luncheon uh, of this particular think tank to talk about this. Um, but the idea comes from this very famous book. And uh, of course, this was anonymous in the late 1600s when it was first published. It's not anonymous today. So many of you have probably read the two treatises of government. And if you pick it up today, uh, there is an author on it. You will see at the bottom that this is the two treatises of government by the late learned John Locke. And to say that someone has the inalienable right to the fruits of their own labor, that is an elegant way of describing Locke's theory of property rights in the second treatise. So I don't have time to go through it all with you today, but the short version is that Locke, he was thinking in terms of agrarian society. So he's thinking of farmers and he's explaining that people have these rights, these freedoms and liberties that don't come from, let's say a king who shows up and says, I have the right to rule you, but I'm a benevolent ruler. So you'll have some rights. And they're not even rights that exist because we, the people got together and consented to a government that would give us rights. Locke said these freedoms, these liberties are inalienable rights. They, they come from natural law. No one can take them away from us because no one's giving them to us. They exist. And so Locke explained that if you're, let's say, a farmer and you're working, your labor, your effort carries all those rights and freedoms with it. So if you plant a seed and the seed grows into a crop and you harvest the crop, then because all of that liberty and freedom flowed into that thing you created, you have an inalienable right to that property. And so how would you describe that in a simple way in a document like a constitution? Well, you would say that the people have an inalienable right to the enjoyment of the fruits of their labor. And that is precisely what the framers had in mind in this provision. You can see that their concern was they were thinking of the black citizens of North Carolina. And they understood that we were adding all these civil liberties for the African-American citizens of our state in the 1868 Constitution. And of course, the U.S. Constitution in the 14th Amendment did so as well. But the framers here in North Carolina were concerned that those civil liberties weren't enough, that to truly have equality and freedom, everyone needed economic power. And how do you have economic power? You have to be able to be free to compete in the marketplace. And if the government is keeping you out to keep some favored people 
uh, in their privileged position, you won't have that power and you won't truly have that equality. That was what the framers were thinking about. So it's not just me that figured this out. Uh, <laughs> the Supreme Court of North Carolina understood this um, for a time. And so let me tell you about that. So heading into the New Deal era. So we're now, I think we're in the 1930s, the 1940s, that era. And you'll sometimes hear uh, scholars describe this thing called the rise of the administrative state, but you can definitely see it here in North Carolina. All of a sudden during the New Deal era, all these boards and commissions stop, so they start popping up everywhere. And there's all these rules about the workplace and licenses and things, rules about the government saying, come to us and get our permission uh, before you uh, do anything. And so there started to be fruits of their labor clause lawsuits. Um, I'll give you two examples. Uh, the Dry Cleaners Commission of North Carolina. So the state created a Dry Cleaners Commission and said, if you want to clean other people's clothes for money, come to us first. Here's a whole bunch of rules. If you comply with all these rules, we'll give you a license. Another one, the Board of Photographic Examiners. If you wanted to take people's picture for money, if you wanted to be a professional photographer, you needed to come and get a license from the state of North Carolina. So the Supreme Court just struck these down. They said, this isn't even close. These are uh, completely, totally unconstitutional. They violate the fruits of their labor clause. And why? Well, the court explained, we understand what the framers of this provision had in mind. And the thing is, cleaning other people's clothes for money or taking people's pictures or before there were cameras, you know, painting their portraits, people have been doing these things in North Carolina for as long as North Carolina has been around. And so you can't come in now and create these barriers to keep people out. That's precisely what these words in the Constitution were designed to prevent. So things were going really well for the fruits of their labor clause. And then uh, into the 1960s, all of a sudden, you know, just like that, uh, this right is, takes a gut punch. It's, it's pretty much meaningless today. You'll still see fruits of their labor clause challenges, um, but they just don't mean much anymore. Um, and so you might be wondering, well, what happened? And I have an explanation. It's the thesis of my academic paper. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you that explanation just yet, because I think if I told you the story of just one of these provisions, you might be able to say, well, you know, that's an outlier. Uh, you know, it's a one-off. The judges must have messed up, but we're not in a constitutional crisis here of eroding uh, these fundamental economic liberties in the Constitution. And I actually think that that is the case. And so let me persuade you by showing you it's not an outlier, it's not a one-off, it's a pattern. And so to do that, I'm now gonna go back in time. Let's go all the way back to 1776. And I wanna talk to you about patents and monopolies. So you all know what these are, right? Patents and monopolies. So, you know, patent, think Thomas Edison, right? You've uh, thought up some idea. Nobody else has thought of it before. So you go and you get the patent so that uh, some other person can't come along and steal your idea and, and make all the money. And it makes sense to have a patent system like that, right? Because it encourages innovation uh, to have a patent system like that. And so what about a monopoly? And now, of course, economists have sophisticated, you know, complicated explanations of what a monopoly is. But even children understand the basic idea of a monopoly because they've seen someone get lucky on their dice rolls and be the first one to land on Boardwalk and Park Place, right? And then uh, they dominate the market. And if you come around to those final squares and need a place to stay, you're gonna have to pay a lot of money. And so I, I think people understand today that just a general idea of a monopoly is some private company using their market power to totally dominate the market. So here's the thing, in the 18th century, so in say 1776, that's not what patents and monopolies meant. So the framers of our original constitution had a different understanding of what those words meant. So this was during a time, um, an economic system that we call the English mercantile system. And so to the framers a patent or letters patent was this legal instrument. And let me show you one. It's these instruments. So it's just a piece of paper that the king would give to favored merchants and say, you know, hey, merchant, I like you. Here's the patent on, let's say, soap for the city of New Bern. And that would mean that this merchant is the only person who can sell soap in the city of New Bern. Now, this merchant did not invent soap. It's just that the king likes this merchant. And you can see right here, George III, by the grace of God, is telling everyone 
only this merchant can sell soap in New Bern. So these letters patent uh, gave this exclusivity that people of this time called a monopoly. That's what they meant by monopolies. They meant state-sponsored exclusivity, state-sponsored monopolies. So the word, the idea of a monopoly was that the government would show up, the king would show up and say, hi, I like you, here's a monopoly. That's how the framers understood it. And these patents and the monopolies they created were oppressive for the people of North Carolina at the time. And so in our original constitution, in that declaration of rights I told you about, the first thing that you'll find is what's often called popular sovereignty. So it's just a basic statement that uh, we the people are in charge now. So there's no more king, we consent to form a government. That's the first thing in the Declaration of Rights. But then the first right that comes after that is a provision that says uh, from now on, the state, the government can't give any special treatment to any person or business unless, unless that special treatment is given because in exchange that person or that business provides a public service. And unless that, pro that person's providing some public service in exchange, no more special benefits, no special treatment. And then the framers also add a provision even more uh, expressly that says monopolies are against the genius of a free state and are not allowed. And these two provisions having just described to you uh, what was going on, what patents and monopolies were, you can understand what was the purpose of these provisions. It was economic liberty. These are anti-corporate cronyism provisions. The framers were saying, never again in North Carolina will we have the state picking and choosing who gets to be in business or who doesn't, who gets their monopoly or their exclusivity and who doesn't, uh, these sorts of things. So again, these provisions were very aggressively enforced by the Supreme Court of North Carolina, which understood precisely what they meant. And so you'll find many, many examples of the Supreme Court over time, striking down provisions that provided special treatment, um, these sort of uh, cronyism or favoritism from the government to certain people. So, and even some that uh, we would consider as very vital public servants. So for example, there, in the 1940s, the state gave um, firefighters a special privilege. If you had a heart attack while you were at home at night as a firefighter, that was automatically considered an occupational disease, so you could get workers' comp benefits. And if anybody else had a heart attack at night, they'd have to show that it happened because of the type of work they're in. Now, if you think of firefighters, they're core public servants, right? It's hard to think of public service, a better example of it, than rushing into a burning building to save someone's life. But what the court said is, well, that might be true, but that's what firefighters do. Show us what firefighters are giving the state in exchange for this new benefit that they've received. And the court said there just isn't one. And there's many, many other examples, including a bank that tried to have an amendment slipped into a bill in the 1870s to give it an advantage. And that's in the uh, article in Carolina Journal. You can read about that. So over and over again, the courts are striking these down. Um, but then just as with fruits of their labor clause, along comes a case and just like that, it's gone. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you about my thesis. You know, why did this happen? And the explanation is, along came a case for each of these provisions where there was a very powerful interest group that wanted things to stay the way it is. Why? Because they make money when the government puts up these barriers, when the government plays favorites, um, when it rewards its cronies, when the government says, you need our permission to do something. That benefits the established groups that are already there. And these groups are often very powerful. And as I said at the beginning, most people have never heard of these provisions in the state constitution. Let's be honest with ourselves. Um, you know, does the public have any idea there's a monopolies clause in our state constitution or a fruits of their labor clause? This is just not the sort of thing that the public's aware of. And so you can imagine a powerful interest group taking advantage of that by arguing that, well, if, if this lawsuit's successful and it really harms us by upsetting this established regime, we will jump up and down and scream that the courts have gone off the rails, that these are activist judges that aren't doing what courts are going to be doing because the public has no idea that these rights are there. And they'll just think that these judges are uh, changing the way things work in a way that judges ought not do. And so I'll give you, I can give you the actual examples of this. So fruits of their labor clause, what happened? Well, remember the court's saying, look, people have been cleaning each other's clothes for money. 
They've been taking photographs or painting portraits for money as long as the state's been around. So you can't create barriers or require a license for that. So a guy comes into court in the 1960s and says, hey, I also want to do something that people in North Carolina have been doing for as long as North Carolina has been around. If my neighbors want to sell their house and I've got lots of connections in the community and can find a buyer, I want to go find the buyer for them. I'll put them together and I'll make a little bit of money getting that sale done. And that's something people have always done in North Carolina. Why would I need a license to do that? And now you can see the problem, right? Because uh, to say there's no more dry cleaners commission, to say there's no state board of photographic examiners, that's not particularly earth shattering. But to have the court, the Supreme Court of North Carolina say, guess what? There's no more realtors. You don't need a license anymore to, uh, uh, to be a real estate broker. That would be very impactful. And as you might imagine, uh, realtors know lots of people, don't they? And so realtors uh, could go to the public and say, you know, our lives have just been completely devastated, our profession, by having these, this licensing regime removed. And we're angry about that because we think these judges uh, are not doing what judges are supposed to do. So I'll give you another example. The Monopolies Clause. What happened? It's the early 1980s. A car dealer wants to open a Jeep dealership in North Wilkesboro. Goes to the state, which heavily regulates automobile sales. And the state says, ah, sorry, uh, we think there's enough Jeep dealerships up in the mountains, so we're not going to let you open your dealership. And so he goes to court, this car dealer, and he says to the Supreme Court, hey, the state of North Carolina, they think they're King George again. And remember the patents? You know, you're the only one who can sell soap. Well, now the state is saying, uh, guess what? Uh, only these people that we like can sell Jeeps up in the mountains, not you. How is that any different? Um, but you can imagine, again, in the early 1980s, the power of uh, car dealers. And also the automobile manufacturers had an interest in making sure this regulatory regime that existed remains in place because they rely on it and the stream of commerce it creates to get their cars into the hands of consumers. And they don't want that entire system blown up by a court decision. So again, you can imagine the power of uh, these car dealers and big auto in the early 1980s uh, and what the justices of the Supreme Court might be faced with. Um, so the point I'm making here, what, what happened, you know, what is my explanation? What happened is in these cases, uh, the justices are worried. They back down because of the concern of the consequences of the decision. And, you know, some of those could have been very selfish concerns because these powerful interest groups, of course, when we elect judges, could work very hard to throw the judges that decided that case and struck down uh, that regulatory regime out of office, right? But I think there's this other concern, which is that um, judges are worried about the public perception of the justice system and having people have faith in the justice system. The rule of law is so important. Uh, it's a foundation, not just of all of our rights, but of capitalism as well. We need people to know that you can come to court and resolve your disputes fairly. And if the, if the public loses confidence that that's what the courts are doing, upholding the rule of law, that's harmful. And so justices of the Supreme Court looking at these cases may have been worried that if these powerful groups really argued that the court had made some sort of crazy decision based on some little known provision in the constitution that no one had ever heard of, that it would hurt the public confidence in the courts. Um, and so what they did in each of these cases is they didn't just ignore the provision, but they looked at each of these provisions and said, well, what we'll do is we'll decide if what the government is doing, if the regulation, the license that's required, whatever it is, we'll decide if the government has a rational explanation for why they're doing this. So if it's totally arbitrary, we'll say it's unconstitutional. But if the government has a reason for it, then we'll say it's okay. And if you've been paying attention to my talk here, you should know that that, well, that's kind of crazy. If you look at the words in the constitution, you know, the monopolies clause says, monopolies are against the genius of a free state and shall not be allowed. It's very strange to read that and say, well, I guess rational monopolies were probably okay <laughs> in the view of the framers and the people at the time, right? That's, that's very strange. And, but that's where we are now. Um, all of these provisions, all of these protections are still in the constitution. Um, they just don't mean what the framers likely intended them to mean. Um, and so you might be wondering, well, you know, what can we do about it? And, you know, we've got experts here and I think they have a lot of ideas. So at this point, I'm going to hand it back over to Donna so we can hear from them. 
Okay, Judge, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great presentation, and thank you for uh, making it in terms that someone who is not an attorney like me can understand. So I really do appreciate that. Uh, we're going to welcome back in Jeanette Doran from the North Carolina Institute for Constitutional Law and John Guzay, my colleague here at the Locke Foundation. John is a senior fellow uh, in legal studies. Now, all of you are attorneys, and so I'm going to take advantage of your expertise. Judge, before we get reaction from John and Jeanette, I just wanted to ask one follow-up question. Did I understand you correctly early on that you believe that this is a crisis in North Carolina? essentially the weakening of these constitutional protections? I think that's fair because you know, the way to say it is if, if the framers included fundamental rights in the constitution and then we don't have them anymore, although the words are still there, you know, if, the, if our constitutional rights are one of the most important things in our society, I would certainly call it a crisis to say that they're, somehow they're gone although nothing's changed. So yes, I think this is something that the public ought to be very concerned about. Jeanette, I'm going to go to you for a reaction first. Um, do you think it's a crisis as well? And what do you make of what the judges presented here today? Uh, well, first, Donna, thank you for having me. But uh, I couldn't agree more that this is a crisis. And I think Judge Dietz has set it out um, from a historical and, and overarching perspective very nicely. We are now faced with a judiciary and a public that seem to proceed as if there are these sort of hidden footnotes in the Constitution that these clauses don't really matter or they kind of matter, but not a whole lot. That simply isn't the case. And we as, as a state shouldn't allow government to just pretend that these provisions don't matter. They do matter. And I think we're seeing a lot of that uh, developing in the midst of the pandemic crisis. Uh, we're seeing a lot of litigation, for example, on the fruits of their own labor clause. So hopefully that will breathe in new life um, and hopefully we'll get a, a reinvigorated judicial approach, uh, an independent kind of uh, evaluative doctrine to make sure that government is following these very important, very critical uh, constitutional provisions, but we're absolutely in a crisis. John? I agree about the crisis, and I also agree with Jeanette that that was a brilliant presentation, Judge. I loved it. I think you're exactly right. Everything you said was perfect. I was making notes, and the first thing I was going to ask you was, what can we do about this? But since you've turned the table on us, I guess <laughs> my only thought is that we just have to keep litigating. The law changes gradually it's one case at a time and and i think there's reason to be hopeful here i i first noticed that i first became aware that state constitutions provided more protection for economic liberties than the federal constitution all the way back in 2015 in a case that i'm sure um the judge is familiar with but the the uh people in the audience may not be was patel versus texas department of licensing and regulation. And that was a case involving, uh, what was it? Was it uh, eyebrow threaders? I think that's what it was. Anyway, they were going to uh, stop them from, you know, you see these kiosks in malls where people, you can get your eyebrows threaded and it's perfectly harmless and safe. But nevertheless, cosmetologists in Texas thought that they are only licensed cosmetologists ought to be allowed to do it. Long story short, the Texas Supreme Court struck down that law and allowed the eyebrow threaders to go about their business without government interference. And that was a real breakthrough. Um, there's been other cases in other states, including in North Carolina, that have made similar kinds of arguments. And not all of them have ended up winning in court, but they still can have a powerful effect. For instance, we had a, a case in North Carolina involving the craft brewers. They, they invoked many of these constitutional protections to say that they should be allowed to distribute their own beer to bars and, and uh, retail outlets without having to go through the uh, wholesale distributor monopoly. Just the threat of that lawsuit, I think, helped change the mind of the General Assembly and they modified those regulations and gave the craft brewers some breathing space. So it all works together. We just have to keep trying one case at a time. I also think though, it's important to, to uh, note something that Judge Deed said, which is that the problem here really in the courts is what's called the standard of review. And that's a technical term, but he explained it very well. 
if all you have to do to overcome a constitutional right, a right is to say, oh, well, there's a rational reason for doing this, then the monopolists and the uh, others are going to win every time. But that's not the proper set, uh, standard of review that courts should apply to in constitutional cases. And we have to gradually persuade the courts, at least in North Carolina, that they need to take a much stricter look at these kinds of cases. And I hope that could happen over time. But I'm sure Judge Deese has a better idea of how feasible that is than I do. Well, to, to John's point, and also to something that Jeanette referred to about the pandemic, isn't that what we're seeing now is, is a lot of justifications for doing certain things or governments invoking certain powers based on either public health concerns or public safety concerns that the officials say override uh, the normal uh, standard of practice, so to speak. And Judge Dietz, by the way, I want to just remind folks, he is a sitting court of appeals judge, so there might be certain things or cases that we talk about here that the judge really can't comment on. So I understand, Judge Dietz, if, if you want to avoid certain certain issues. But um, it just seems to me that there's there's this justification saying, well, it, we aren't in normal times. Jeanette or John, would you like to comment on that? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll jump in right there. Um, I think the pandemic is yet another example of a really good way to make really bad law. Uh, I, another older example of that is frankly the New Deal and the Great Depression. Uh, which gave rise to lots and lots of bad decisions. We saw in the early days of the pandemic with some of the lawsuits that came out, there was a tendency on the part of judges to, I think, be, be very deferential toward the governor. Um, we didn't have a lot of, of scientific information about COVID. We, we, not just in North Carolina, but nationally and globally, there was a, a great deal of concern. So one of the things that I think we should emphasize going forward is trying to, to sort of rein that in. And part of doing that requires that the public have a real appreciation for the difference between, and Judge Dietz touched on this briefly, the difference between judicial restraint, judicial activism, and judicial engagement. What we don't want are judges who have a, a sort of misguided sense of judicial restraint, and they end up being, for lack of a better expression, wimpy judges. What we want are we want judges who aren't activists. I mean, we don't want judges out there rewriting the law, or rewriting the statutes, constitution, regulations, any of that. What we want are judges who will do their job of engaging in a thoughtful analysis of what the constitution requires, what it prohibits, and having that standard so low as just a rational basis. And that's an incredibly low bar. Um, and I, I think the constitution requires something more and the public needs to make sure that we're electing judges who believe that as well and will engage when it is their duty to do so. And it is the duty of the courts to strike down laws or other government action when it is violative of the constitution. So we have a responsibility as members of the public to, to push for that either by exercising our vote or as John mentioned, engaging in litigation. And that's why here at the John Locke Foundation, we have um, for years and years now really tried to play an informational and educational role when it comes to elections of judicial officials by participating in forums. I've hosted several forums where we ask candidates for uh, judicial offices, what are your views? What is your philosophy about constitutional issues so that people can understand and be more informed when they go to the ballot box to actually vote? Because it does matter what someone's philosophy and, and view of the North Carolina Constitution is. Also want to point out that um, one of the folks who's uh, watching us right now, Justin Pearson, has just 
posted into the comments section of our Facebook page the IJ case, uh, John Gose, that you referred to, Texas eyebrow threading. And so folks want to um, get the details of that case, they can uh, click on that there. So Justin, thank you for doing that. You know, John, as I was listening to the judge in his presentation, and he's talking about monopolies and the essentially a permission slip from government, uh, the first thing that really jumped into my head about, you know, present day, how this is taking place is, is the whole uh, debate over certificate of need in North Carolina, essentially a government permission slip if you're a doctor or a health care provider that wants to add a new service or expand. If you're a hospital, you want to add a, more a surgical centers, et cetera. So, John, it, it persists to this day. Well, it does. And, and it's one of the cases where we, we, we're trying to work two, two angles on this or get some synergy going between our efforts to educate the public and the members of the General Assembly on the one hand and litigation on the other, which is sometimes the only way you can get the General Assembly's attention. There's been two cases that I know about. Uh, well, there's been many cases challenging certificate of need laws over the years, but two recent ones that we've been involved in. The first one was uh, filed a couple of years ago, and we filed a uh, the amicus brief in that case. But that, unfortunately, the doctor who brought it because of COVID, his practice sort of fell apart and, and he had to drop out. But there's a new suit involved um, involving a, uh, an eye surgeon from um, eastern part of the state. And there's another case going forward, and we filed another amicus brief. The challenge in both of those cases is how to get the courts and specifically the Court of Appeals to reconsider some of its previous decisions on, on this topic. And that's, um, I know Judge Deach isn't gonna be able to comment on this case because he knows it's gonna probably be coming before him pretty soon. But I wonder, Judge, if you've got any thoughts about how we can make the argument that previous decisions invoking a, a very low standard of review like rational basis notwithstanding it's time for the courts to look at these cases with a little more rigor. Have you any thoughts you could share with us about that? Yes. Yeah, so I, in the academic paper, uh, part of, part of the thesis is in explaining this is what you know what what can we do about it and um, you know laying that out and um, explaining. I think that this idea that to emphasize to judges that these are special provisions unique to North Carolina, so they should have what lawyers call their own independent doctrine, meaning they should have their own test. We shouldn't be copying this test of rationality that the federal courts use in interpreting the due process clause of the U.S. Constitution. That's where this concept came from, because we're special. These, uh, the U.S. Constitution doesn't have any language um, like these provisions in our Constitution. So judges should be looking to the meaning of these provisions and coming up with our own test that's special for us. So that, that's the argument I make in the paper. And you know, as, as John pointed out, what, one interesting thing is in, in the first certificate of need lawsuit, the Supreme Court held that certificate of need laws violated the monopolies clause and were unconstitutional. But that case came before the American Motors case, the car dealer I told you about up in North Wilkesboro. So by the time that the certificate of need laws were reenacted and these cases returned to the courts, as John said, the courts were applying this rationality standard and saying, well, is there a rational reason the government might, might have all these regulations um, in these CUN laws? And the courts have uh, generally said you, there seems to be an explanation for pretty much everything. In fact, as I point out in the paper, many scholars have said that this rationality test, um, what's called rational basis for lawyers, is a test the government can never lose because it's also a hypothetical test. The judges who are considering the, the lawsuit, the challenge, can go back into their chambers with their very smart law clerks and just dream up any reason, any, anything can be the, the rational explanation. It doesn't even have to be the one that the government presented, let's say, in their legal papers. Um, and so you can almost always, if you have enough time, come up with some rational explanation for anything, particularly when, since we know these are anti-cronyism provisions in our Constitution, I hate to even admit this, but cronyism is often rational for politicians. They have reasons to do it, although it may harm the public. Lots of things that, lots of laws and lots of decisions by lawmakers harm some portion of the public. There has to be line drawing uh, in, in legislation. And so um, that's been the challenge is, uh, you know, oftentimes, even if it's blatant favoritism or cronyism, you can see the reason why the legislature might have done it. And that means that under the current standard, that case would be a very difficult one to win. 
Judge, you also referred to um, some judges who might be concerned about shaking trust in the judi judicial system or trust in government. And again, as a, as a non-lawyer, I hearken back to the U.S. Supreme Court and the Obamacare uh, decision. I remember so clearly uh, thinking that, well, John Roberts, when he went through his nomination uh, process for the Supreme Court, that he had said something about, I'm, I'm an umpire, I just call balls and strikes. And yet, now we know about the decision that, that uh, deemed Obamacare constitutional, that it was like all this uh, logistics and, and kind of twisting to try to figure out a way to make that constitutional. And at least some analysis has been that he might have been concerned about just what you said, uh, shaking trust in the system. It seems like a perverse incentive, a, a perverse way to think about um, ruling on something. Yes, but I, I think that's true. Many scholars have pointed out that they think um, Chief Justice Roberts, in a number of cases, has been playing that role of trying to avoid um, letting the court move, be too aggressive in its decisions and undermining trust. That is what I believe happened to these economic liberty protections. But to be fair, there's also something else in North Carolina that, that we have to acknowledge, which is we elect our judges. So um, an Article Three judge, they're called the uh, a federal judge under the U.S. Constitution, um, has to be removed only by impeachment. They stay in their job for life. And so they don't have the pressure um, that can exist when judges like other elected officials believe if they anger the people who keep them in office that they can be fired. Um, and so that I, I think that certainly played a role as well because these powerful interest groups um, you know, can, can assert pressure in elections and that could also be um, in the minds of some judges or justices in a controversial case. And I, you know, so I think some people would prefer not not to admit that, but I, I don't understand why it's just being honest about the system and that these are decisions that are being made by uh, public officials who are elected by the public. And then I, can I just point out that this is a reason why something the judge mentioned earlier is very important, and that's public education on the nature of our Constitution and its contents. The more we get voters to know about the Constitution and what it says, the more likely they are to vote for judges who will um, honor it and, and, and vindicate it. And I'm not sure how this happens, but maybe every public school student in the state ought to read the Constitution at some point. That seems like the minimum that we could expect of educated citizens. Anyway, I just want to reemphasize what the judge said about public education. I think that's going to be part of the solution if there is one. Well, and it, I'll jump in there, uh, if you don't mind. I think it's important for the public to be educated not only on the Constitution itself, but on sort of how it's been interpreted and how the courts are approaching it. That's one of the things that um, NCICL does. We have a, a blog that's out there and we try to break down not only the provisions of the Constitution, but how courts are interpreting those various provisions. That's incredibly important for people to understand. Um, and it's also incredibly important for people to understand that they have a sort of civic duty to participate in the election of our judges. They shouldn't be bashful about that. And I think, unfortunately, there are a lot of folks who feel like just, just because they aren't a lawyer, they feel like um, they're not really in a position to weigh in on the election of judges, um, and nothing could be further from the truth. Well, I think particularly if you're talking about educating kids or even high schoolers and college students to have presentations, frankly, like the one that Judge Dietz just made, which is very interesting and compelling and really puts the law in terms that that people can understand and relate to, that might be helpful. Judge, are we teaching, are we teaching the Constitution and and law also the way we should be, not only in K-12, but college, and then frankly, right into law school? It's a challenge. Um, so I actually encountered this um, this past summer. So um, Justice Phil Berger on the, on the state Supreme Court uh, and I created a, uh, we called it the North Carolina Constitutional Academy. We created a video series for high schoolers who were stuck at home and just looking for something to do and needing something on the resume because lots of after-school activities were canceled. And we said, well, you can 
participate in this little seminar and you'll have something on your resume for college applications. Of course, we had a limited amount of time. And when we started looking at what we could teach, we only had room for the Bill of Rights. There just wasn't enough time to really get into everything else. So I think part of the challenge is all of our liberties and our freedoms are so important. And uh, finding time to get to them all can be a real challenge. But I think you're right that there there is a way to do that. And also, I think law school is an area where um, the state constitution is, um, is sometimes overlooked. It's um, I think in particular because the challenge is most law schools these days want to see themselves as national law schools, not just teaching one state's law. So then you'd be teaching a course that's talking about 51 different constitutions. And, you know, that's just way too much even for a law school course. And um, but the problem with that is then you have lawyers that don't really understand these provisions in their history. And so they have trouble even coming into court and thinking of making the argument that the court should interpret it in the way that it was intended by the framers. So that's also, I think, a problem. I just think it's so important, Judge, about something you said about um, state constitutions in general, and I think it's it's particular now to North Carolina, considering these unique provisions. You said that a state constitution says something about our identity. What does our constitution say about our identity in North Carolina? Yeah, you know, there there's a lot of different provisions you can you can point to, but I think the ones I talked about today, um, this bundle of rights is, I mean, the reason I describe it as economic liberty is I think the theme, the thing you can take away from it is that, and, and of course these provisions came in over time, they, they weren't all at one time, but you can, and that I think makes it even more meaningful that it's never changed, that there's always been this commitment to saying no cronyism, no favoritism, we all enter the workforce and the marketplace and we compete fairly, and that's the way it should work in North Carolina, and we don't need the government's permission to do that. And that, that I think, is a theme you can take away from the framers um, putting these very special provisions in our Constitution. And, you know, today we have so much conversation about justice and fairness. It seems to me that you're talking about economic fairness here. And as you put it, economic power is, is freedom, essentially. So if framed the proper way, this could be a really compelling argument to people who are very much open-minded these days about wanting things to be uh, fair, a level playing field for, for every person. Uh, it seems like there's, there's an opportunity at this point in time. You could even make an equity argument, it seems to me. I'm not all, always fond of the way that word gets used, but it's just inequitable for some entrenched interest to get a monopoly on certain areas of business or occupations and, and exclude everybody else. And since we're mentioning equity, I'm sure it's a fact that um, African-Americans and other so-called people of color are more often than not among the groups that are excluded by these laws. Yes, I, you know, I, I think a lot of the occupational licensing regulation and, and statutes that we see have a disproportionate effect on minorities. We've seen that there's been uh, a lot of litigation in various places across the country over particularly some cosmopolit or cosmetology issues. Uh, the, the effect is across the board, but is sometimes more concentrated among certain demographics of society, and that shouldn't be overlooked. And it does seem that those of us who um, are are in the arena talking about public policy ideas and, and freedom and opportunity should be making this point more, that we're talking about opportunity for people and um, not favoritism, and that this goes all the way back to the very basics of the North Carolina Constitution. And so perhaps... We're in a situation now, not only because of court cases, but because maybe we just haven't been framing the conversation correctly. I think that's right. We need to do a better job. Um, I hope we can all start, start doing it as well as, as Judge Deese did at the beginning. That was a good presentation. We ought uh, we to share that around. Well, I think we should as well. Um, Jeanette, I know that when, when you are working with your organization, the Institute for Constitutional Law, that you focus a lot on um, issues of what's in the Constitution and when uh, rulings are veering from it. 
Do you find that this issue of the, the economic liberty clauses is, is the one that comes up most frequently, or are there others, other areas that you're finding uh, troubling? I think this is probably the most troubling from the, the perspective of NCICL. Uh, but part of that is sort of our particular focus. And before people get too discouraged, you know, the, the panel today, we've all been talking about what the courts have done, getting it wrong, how they've lowered the, the bar on things. And we're stuck with a lot of, I think, bad case law that applies only a, a rational review test. We should also note that there have been some cases, not nearly enough, but there have been some cases uh, that give us a glimmer of hope, that there is a, a good chance that courts will heed their, their duty. And one of those cases springs to mind, um, it's a case from 2013 and it's a Supreme Court, state Supreme Court decision on the just and equitable taxation clause, um, IMT. A local government had increased a, a tax about 60,000% from $12.5 a year to $7,500 a year. And when it went up to the Supreme Court, um, a unanimous court basically said that was untethered from the moorings of the Constitution. So we know that once in a while there is some progress. What we need to do is encourage more of those kinds of cases and encourage the public to understand those, those cases and the history of all of these clauses. But the economic liberty clauses, they're, they're not quite as sexy as say free speech clauses um, or free speech cases or religious liberty cases, but they're just as important. They're simply important in a slightly different um, section of our civic lives. So we need to reemphasize that. I'll, I'll add one thing. Um, I, that's a wonderful point that Jeanette made and it, it, it ties into something I, I pointed out in my paper. So the just and equitable tax clause is another provision I talk about in the paper. And, and I was cheating a little bit knowing the history of that one um, because the case that Jeanette mentioned, I was the lawyer in that case that thought up that just and equitable tax clause claim. And that was, um, you know, as Jeanette said, the mid 2000s. And that was a clause that was inserted in the 1930s dur during the New Deal era over concern about all these growing forms of taxation. And it took all the way until the Supreme Court decided that case um, just a few years ago, really, um, for a lawyer to come in and make the argument and for the court to address it. And all the time, despite all the taxation that there's been in the time since then, no lawyer had come in and made that argument. And again, I think so part of it is not just educating the public, but also educating the bar um, and the judiciary and understanding these provisions so that they can be uh, litigated. Because I think there, there are provisions, you'll never encounter something in the US Constitution and realize, wow, I've never seen this before. No, I've never, you know, this uh, discussion of, you know, the petitions clause or the or free speech or religious liberty, I can't believe this is in here. There are things in state constitutions that people stumble upon. And I'll give you one funny example from my paper that was in the national news is a judge in Texas recently accidentally resigned from his office. There's this provision in the uh, Texas constitution that says if you're a judge and you announce you're running for another judicial office, you automatically resign. It's called the automatic resignation clause. He was unaware of that and announced after he had just won his election that he planned to run for a higher court and immediately resigned from office. And oh it, it made the national news. And it's another example of there was a judge that I guess had not been aware of a provision in, in the constitution. We've got an interesting question and a comment um, in, in the comment section of our Facebook page. I'm going to pose this, and any of you feel free to jump in. This is from Scott. Going back to the standard of review, how does the court justify using a rational standard to review a specific state constitutional right, anti-monopoly, in light of case holdings such as this? Strict scrutiny applies when state action, quote, interferes with the exercise of a fundamental right. Stevenson v. Bartlett. Now, is that enough information for, for you all to comment on, Judge? And I don't know if that's something that you want to stay away from. 
Well, let me start out by just saying what I pointed out in my my paper, and then I'll let the experts talk about this book. Uh, I can't justify it. That was the point of writing my paper is I, I, I had to find another explanation because I couldn't I couldn't explain it. So I'd, I'd be interested in John Jeanette's views on that. I, I think the lower standard of review is indefensible. There's no other way to put it. I agree. And that, that, that's what when we try to um, put in our two cents for these various amicus briefs, that's what we always say that this is a constitutional right that we quote that same that same decision and we say this is a this is a constitutional right and you cannot simply apply a rational basis it's got to be strictly construed. And one of the problems with the rational basis test and Judge Dietz touched on this when he said that judges and their law clerks will sometimes go back and it's as if um, the approach to judging is as you know it, it's it devolves into an exercise in creative writing. If there's any possible justification for the law, courts are upholding it. Yeah, and that's not what they should be doing, but that's in fact what rational basis generally comes down to, an exercise in creative thinking, and then the opinions are an exercise in creative writing, mental gymnastics, that's, that's indefensible and entirely inconsistent with the plain language of, of the Constitution and its history. But of course, if we have lawyers who then are watching the case law and are seeing that these legal challenges are becoming successful and that we're getting further and further away from, from um, upholding these particular clauses, doesn't that just create an incentive for litigation? Hey, you know, I'll, I'll roll the dice and see if I can get a win for my client because of the pressure or the precedent that's been set of moving away? Well, sometimes we want litigation, Donna. When our rights are being trampled, there's nothing wrong with litigating to, to preserve them. Absolutely. I think litigation has a bad reputation. Um, if, if government is encroaching on our constitutional rights, how do we push back against it? We push back by litigation. You know, the, the problem with that, unfortunately, is that litigation is incredibly expensive. It's incredibly time consuming. It would be far better for us to um, prevent a constitutional violation before it happens. And one way we do that is by working cooperatively um, with legislators and other elected officials to make sure that they're familiar with these constitutional provisions. I know, for example, I, um, I did a blog post about a year ago on the fruits of their own labor clause. And I had a couple of legislators who were unfamiliar with it. They asked where it was hidden in the constitution. And I said, it's article one, section one. It's oh my. <laughs> not hidden. <laughs> you know, it's the second sentence really. But what we need to do is you know, work to prevent a violation and also not be bashful about standing up when there is a violation. And we've got a lot of great groups out there doing public interest litigation, whether it's Institute uh, of Justice with the eyebrow threading case that John mentioned or Pacific Legal Foundation. I mean, just last week, they had a hearing in a lawsuit where they're representing a bar owner. Um, down in Greenville, who's basically getting put out of business by executive orders coming from Governor Cooper. So we shouldn't be bashful about litigation, but we should also recognize that the best, most efficient way to uphold the Constitution is to prevent a violation in the first place. And that means engaging with elected officials, letting them know that we know what our rights are, and that we're going to stand up for them. Sounds Judge. like maybe the General Assembly needs uh, a, a course like the one Judge Deese talked about giving to uh, college students. How about that? Maybe we could put something like that together. You know, Judge, it really was a, a, a really good uh, presentation. And I think that all the people who are viewing us right now and will be viewing this later are really going to appreciate um, how you've laid that out for us. And Judge, we're coming to the end of our time here. So I'd like to give you the, the final opportunity for your thoughts on uh, 
the issue in general and why it's so important to you that you've chosen to make a public presentation about this and to write an academic paper that's going to be published by, I believe it's Elon that's publishing that for you? That's right. Uh, yeah, well, just thank you for letting me be here to present it. I think um, we all acknowledge that one of the things we can do is just raise awareness. If indeed one of the things that led the justices in these cases to weaken these protections was concern about the integrity or the public's perception of the courts, having the public be aware of these provisions um, reduces and if there's enough awareness eliminates that concern on the, on the part of judges. And so I think uh, that's why I'm so grateful uh, that you had me here today so I could talk about this and, and we can all learn more and spread the word to our friends and neighbors and people we know in the community and, and let them know we've got these amazing economic liberties, these constitutional rights in, in North Carolina. And in fact, we now have Scott who asked that question previously. He's now commenting again, how can we access the judge's paper? Well, Scott, I'll tell you, you can get uh, the judge's column published today by Carolina Journal. Go to carolinajournal.com and you will see it right there. It's also been posted in the comments section here. Now, the academic paper to be published by Elon. Judge, when is that going to uh, be published? I, I'm not actually sure. It's forthcoming, so it's been accepted for publication and reviewed, but I'm not sure when it will actually go to print. So, Scott, you're going to have to wait along with the rest of us for the full academic paper, but um, it is something that's really, really important, and that's why we wanted to talk about it today. really want to thank um, North Carolina Court of Appeals Judge Richard Dietz for giving us the time today. Judge, thank you so much. We know that uh, you are very, very busy and appreciate you devoting this hour to us here. Also want to thank my colleague John Guzet from the Locke Foundation. By the way, you can read John's work at johnlock.org. He analyzes all sorts of legal issues and cases for us here. And Jeanette Doran with the North Carolina Institute for Constitutional Law. Jeanette, where can folks find your work? Uh, we are at ncicl.org. Those letters stand for North Carolina Institute for Constitutional Law, so NCICL.org. I want to thank you all. So if you're interested in these types of issues, the resources are here for you, johnlock.org, also carolinajournal.com, the upcoming academic paper written by Judge Dietz, and ncicl.org, where Jeanette does all of her analysis and writing as well. I want to thank you for joining us and want to ask you one thing. As you think about this and how important the North Carolina Constitution is, we would ask you just to consider those of us who are in the marketplace of ideas, who are bringing you this information and who are working to make sure that the public and our legislators and our judges understand what it means to respect our Constitution. We'd ask you to consider a tax-deductible donation to the John Locke Foundation. It's very easy and fast to do. Just go to johnlock.org. In the upper right-hand corner, there's a Donate tab. Just hit that, and in less than two minutes, you can make a secure tax-deductible donation to help fuel our work on issues like this. We would be very appreciative of your support of our work. I want to thank everybody for joining us. On behalf of the entire John Locke Foundation and Carolina Journal team, I'm Donna Martinez. Join us again next Monday for another edition of Shaftesbury Society. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week.